Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to Biosocial Canada and Choices for Youth webinar on social procurement for economic recovery in Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you so much for joining us today. To kick things off, I'm going to welcome Chelsea McNeil from Choices for Youth to start with a land acknowledgement. Thanks, Tori. Um, we respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsuvit and Nunatuvit and the Innu of Natasanan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all people of this province and we search as we search for a collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Thank you, Chelsea. And if anyone would like to share in the chat where you're joining us from and the traditional lands, um, you're welcome to do so. Um, I didn't introduce myself, but sorry, I'm Tori Williamson from Biosocial Canada and it's great to be here with you today. Um, we are gathered on Zoom, so I'll just do a quick Zoom tour. Um, I invite you to monitor your mute and unmute button in the bottom left corner. Uh, you're welcome to have your video on or off, but all the presenters will have their videos on. And then the chat function, um, we're gonna have a section at the end of the session for Q&A, and you're welcome to add your questions in the chat throughout um, the session and then at the end as well. Um, at the top right hand corner, we've got the gallery view, which I encourage you to use so you can see all the speakers um, or speaker view. And then in the top left, we've got the recording uh, indication. So we will be recording this session today. Now I'm going to introduce our panel. So um, one by one, I'm going to invite each of our panelists to share um, where they're joining us from, what organization and what their connection is to social procurement. So first off, David LePage. Thanks, Tori. David LePage, and I'm the managing partner with Buy Social Canada, and I've had the privilege of working across the country and internationally on social procurement, and excited for this conversation today. And next we have Jerry Higgins. Hi, I'm Jerry Higgins. I'm joining you from the west coast of Scotland. I'm the managing director of Social Enterprise World Forum, uh, but based in Scotland and I have about 10 years experience of working in social procurement, helping the Scottish government to introduce the systems that are in operation today. Thanks, Jerry. And Good Colleen morning. Evans. Good morning, everyone. I'm Colleen Evans. I'm the a second term elected uh, council member of the city of Campbell River and co-chair of the Coastal, Com Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative, uh, CCSPI. Uh, which is here on Vancouver Island. Looking forward to chatting with you a bit more about that this morning. And um, just uh, want to thank everyone for um, joining us today and uh, hearing more about social procurement. And I'll be sharing with you what's happening in our community and also a bit more about CCSPI as we move forward this morning. Thanks, Colleen. And Christy for Fairhome Major. Hi, good morning. Um, over in Victoria on the west coast of Canada, I'm Christy Fairholmader with Scale Collaborative, and we help project manage the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative that Colleen just mentioned, um, which is an initiative of 20 small and mid-sized rural communities that have come together to advance social procurement in their communities. Excited to be here. Chelsea McNeil. Hi everyone, uh, great to be with you from beautiful and rainy St. John's, Newfoundland today. Um, I'm the Director of Education, Employment and Social Enterprise at Choices for Youth, our youth servicing agency. And we've been involved in this social procurement conversation over the last four years. However, we certainly have been practicing and with our community partners practicing social procurement now since the inception of our social enterprises. So pleased to be here with you today and help kind of understand the Newfoundland context around um, economic and social um, development and add some kind of practical opportunities and applications. Thanks, Chelsea. And Sheldon Paul. Hi folks, uh, I'm the executive director of Choices for Youth. Myself and Chelsea are gonna tag team, I guess, a little bit of our talk. Uh, what I'm going to try and illustrate as quickly as I can is the, the evolution of our organization into this space. 
uh, from the beginnings of not necessarily knowing a whole lot about social enterprise and procurement to where we are now, uh, being able to speak to a, a group of you know, well-established and informed partners across the country. Thank you. Wonderful. So we've got a great panel here of uh, varied experience from rural communities working with social procurement. And I'm going to hand it to Chelsea now, and she's going to chair the questions as we talk to each panelist. Super. Thanks so much, Tori. And again, thanks to everyone uh, for being here with us today. Um, we're going to get started um, with David. David uh, is going to give kind of a brief overview of his work and um, we'll go through the panelists kind of one by one and then following that we're going to jump into a series of questions um, to stimulate a bit more of a discussion. So David over to you. Great thanks Chelsea. <clears throat> so I'm just going to try to put a little bit of framework around <clears throat> social procurement sort of the the why and, and the what. <clears throat> when we think about how we buy things, whether it's individuals or government or <clears throat> corporations, we, we, I think we need to recognize that every purchase has an impact and has a multiplier effect. It has an economic impact, it has an environmental impact, and it has a social impact. And what social procurement is trying to do <clears throat> is intentionalize that outcome. So oftentimes we purchase and we think about purchasing as just something that is an economic transaction. We're buying something we need. Where in fact, social procurement is really about changing that <clears throat> from being just an economic transaction to a tool to really build community. So instead of just looking at it as economic outcomes <clears throat> in a purchase of a thing, we think about procurement as a tool to build community capital because it contributes to the environmental capital, it contributes to cultural capital, human capital, and social capital. So procurement oftentimes and historically has been about getting the lowest price. And we really believe that procurement does not have to be a contest of who has the sharpest pencil and who can get the lowest price bidder and, and buyer that it really can become this tool to help us generate community value. When we think about our purchasing and we think about the fact that the research shows us that when we buy locally, we actually can keep almost 50 cents of every dollar spent in our local community versus buying from a global organization which lowers that impact to about 15 cents staying in the community. So the economic impact is just one example. When we think about things like creating the jobs that come with buying <clears throat> from local or buying social and looking at social enterprise outcomes, we really start to see the human capital increase and the social capital that glue in communities. We often think about the fact that um, governments say, well, we can't do this because of trade agreements. Well, actually the trade agreements don't allow us to exclude anyone from bidding, but they do allow us to value community impact. They do allow us to, to reward social enterprises and small businesses as part of the evaluation. So they can't exclude, but they definitely can direct purchasing to create community impact. And in this discussion and preparing for today and talking to Chelsea about the issues of austerity, and I think we've heard this for, for years now, when governments go into austerity, they, they really believe that it's really about spending less and really thinking about cutting. What we really want to discuss is there will be less to spend, but instead of thinking about it as just less to spend, thinking about that spending as an investment, because how we choose to spend it is going to create the value we want. So if we can think about spending as spending tax dollars that we've collected back into community, we're reinvesting taxes back into our communities to create the, the communities we want. So I think, yes, um, frugal and, and all that's gonna come into the decision-making. 
But I think it's also really important to think about what's the greatest value that can be created with every dollar. And we think when we think about the, the economic and the social and the environmental multiplier, then we have to think about best value, not just lowest price. And that goes across every purchase. Every purchase from the credit cards that are held individually by, by, by staff and by public servants, all the way up to major infrastructure investments in the, in the billion dollar range. We've got to think about every purchase and how can every purchase help us create healthy communities. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, now, our next panelist who's gonna speak is Jerry Higgins from Scotland. So Jerry, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my social procurement journey began uh, in about 2007, 2008, when in Scotland, um, the first attempt at social procurement happened, uh, a deliberate uh, engagement of a particular disadvantaged community in the rebuilding of housing and, um, uh, and, and community facilities that uh, were to improve their lives. And um, it went reasonably well as, um, as a pilot project um, could. Um, uh, and soon afterwards, I met David LePage to discuss the opportunity of the major sporting events, the Winter Olympics in Vancouver, the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, the Pan Am Games uh, that, that were to follow in, 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 in Hamilton. And we, uh, we looked at the opportunity of major uh, multi-day sporting events to kickstart a focus on social procurement. Um, in our journey in Scotland, uh, that led to seven or eight years of um, pretty intense development of social procurement systems to a place where I, I could say with confidence that Scotland probably has the best social procurement systems existing in the world right now. Uh, that's not to say that they're working effectively. I'm just saying that the best systems have been developed. Uh, these include um, a Procurement Reform Act 2014. I'm going to post some references into the chat when I'm finished speaking, so um, uh, so you, 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 you should know that. Um, there's the, the Act is a pretty general Act. Um, there's one in the UK Parliament as well. Um, all after acts, acts of Parliament of, this type, of these types uh, don't specify um, a huge amount of behaviours, um, um, but, but it's, a, it's a good framework. Um, but the statutory guidance that underpins the Act um, is, is very, very good. It, it effectively makes it illegal to procure goods or services or works on the basis of lowest cost without considering the sustainability of that procurement. And that was a game changer. It was accompanied by um, a six year program of system change and culture change, where a group of us in the social enterprise sector with um, uh, professional advisors from uh, uh, legal firms and, and consulting firms worked to support the public sector to adjust to the new reality of procurement where they had to consider opportunities to create social value. Now, procurement divisions um, have been hard pressed uh, for, for many years. So this was not an inconsiderable task of switching um, uh, from being focused on lowest cost um, uh, and trying to increase the size of contracts to get better value to suddenly being asked to break contracts down to create more social value. So um, uh, this, this was quite a, a comprehensive and difficult journey. The sustainable um, procurement duty that is on every public body, they need to report on it every year. And they need to publish a report which goes to the Scottish ministers and that has to come out in public. Um, so it, it puts an onus on Scotland's public bodies. So it's enterprise agencies, it's health boards, it's 32 local authorities uh, to tell uh, the public and the government, um, how they have performed in relation to their sustainable procurement duty. And 
I did mention at the start that the system was world class. Um, uh, personally, in my own opinion, um, uh, I think the mainstreaming of this new system um, uh, hasn't been anywhere near as good as it could be. Um, I think when you introduce a new system, you have an obligation to make sure it's working effectively and mainstream properly. And I think the foot has been taken off the gas at the wrong time. Um, so right now, I'm not very sure how much social procurement is happening. It's not being reported particularly effectively. There's no case studies being developed. There's a lack of dialogue between um, people in between commissioners and procurement officers. Um, and there's a lack of support because the support program uh, that was between the social enterprise sector and the procurement community ha has, has finished. So um, it's a bit of a mystery um, in relation to how much social value is being um, created. And um, I'm working hard to try and encourage or shove the Scottish government back into the space where they recognise they've done the hard bit. They've introduced the systems, which includes a new law. Um, uh, so don't take the foot off the gas now. Continue to work to make sure that these systems are producing um, as much value as possible. These systems, we, we do have a focus in Scotland on rural social enterprise policy and, and, and action. Um, the census that has been done every two years since 2015 shows that 33% um, of our social enterprises are in rural areas. And if we go further and we, if we look at the Highlands and Islands, which contains the most remote and rural communities, 22% of the social enterprises are in that land area, which has between 7 and 8% of the population. So social enterprises are a far greater part of the local economy in remote and rural areas than they are in our central belt, which contains our urban populations. And that's clearly because um, uh, there isn't much incentive for commercial businesses to locate in areas um, where there's uh, challenges of um, uh, getting goods to market, challenges to skill, uh, access to skilled labor. So social enterprises and very often those that are run by communities are a greater part of the national mix. Um, so our focus really should be on how can social procurement support remote and rural communities to retain young people, to maintain their community anchor organizations, to develop sustainable tourism opportunities, and to build on the advantages that they have in terms of culture and community and environment um, to ensure that these communities are sustainable. So we do this in a number of ways. One includes focusing on consortia, very often social enterprises themselves aren't of sufficient scale to win a contract coming out from municipality. Um, but if you form consortia where, for instance, there's two in Kantar, Kantar Recycling and Fine Futures, two rural um, uh, recycling and reuse social enterprises are working together to deliver um, a contract um, that previously was let by the local authority to a large commercial um, supplier. So it's by focus on consortia, you can address some of the, uh, some of the challenges. We're also very focused on young people. Um, and my daughter's social procurement, my daughter's social enterprise journey actually began in Newfoundland in 2012 when she attended a conference uh, with me hosted by the Community Sector Council of Newfoundland and Labrador. And she's now running a, a, rural, a rural hub for social enterprises in Scotland, having spent a year in Dalhousie in, in, in Nova Scotia um, two years ago. Um, a big focus on ensuring uh, that young people can engage in social enterprise, both as startups and as volunteers. And uh, an example is in Mid Argyll, in the west coast of Scotland, there's a Mid Argyll Youth Development Services, um, which, in addition to doing the standard stuff that youth organisations do of drop ins and cyber cafe and youth clubs, um, they're, they're also providing uh, support services for other young people. Um, and, and, and for parents, young people with disabilities, and that's procured um, uh, from the local authority and from the health board. So um, uh, our, our public sector community um, is getting more responsive, getting better at procuring services for young people, from young people, and social enterprises is a, is a very important um, part of that. Um, the point that we're going to finish on is the direction that this is heading. And there's been a real emphasis over the last number of years in Scotland, the last few years in Scotland, on community wealth building. And this is where social procurement can really make a difference. The community wealth building approach 
is is one that recognizes that traditional economic development practice and developer led regeneration has really failed and there's a need to um, place control back in the hands of local people and um, this is drawn heavily from the work of the um, the, the Democracy Collaborative in, in Cleveland, Ohio, and from Mondragon um, in, the, in the Basque Country in Spain. And we're, we're seeing that social procurement is now beginning to get more local, is beginning to, in particular in, in, in rural areas, um, uh, it, it, it's one of the priorities of trying to um, bridge the very alien world of procurement um, uh, w um, with local communities and in particular community anchor organizations. And COVID has been a help here um, as some services um, uh, um, stopped uh, um, many community-based social enterprises stepped up and they provided essential services in their communities. They demonstrated their capacity and their value and we're expecting to see an increase um, of social procurement uh, with community anchor organisations as part of Scotland's community wealth building approach in the coming years. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Jerry, thanks so much. Uh, when you were speaking, I've felt as, as someone who lives in Newfoundland, um, some very significant similarities with some of the rural and remote uh, challenges that we face. And it's very inspiring to hear uh, of what's possible. Uh, so thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, I'm going to call on C Colleen Evans. And Colleen, the floor is yours. OK, great. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to uh, begin by acknowledging that we live on the traditional territory of the Lakwata people, and that uh, Campbell River is home to three First Nations, the Wewaikam, the Wewaikai, and the Hamalco First Nation. And I thought what I would do is just give you um, a brief overview of uh, the path that has led me to social procurement. And then I'd like to spend uh, a bit of time talking about the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative and just give you some highlights of uh, what's involved in that. So maybe just to begin, um, really um, my uh, experience in social procurement has really been related to my career, which has been in fund development and business. And uh, I've been directly involved in the evolution of fund development, and fund development and developing the types of policies that really um, help drive social enterprise and opportunities for nonprofit organizations to look at ways to diversify their funding streams. Um, many of you will recall that sort of two sides of the table, the giver and the receiver in terms of funds from corporate organizations. And uh, it was based on the fact that a lot of um, uh, corporations that I was working with at the time that I uh, had my career in Calgary, uh, they were really looking for ways to be more strategic in their funding to nonprofit organizations. They were developing at the time what was called corporate social uh, responsibility policies and looking at how they can invest their giving to have more uh, outcome, both for their customers um, and for the not-for-profits they were investing in, but as importantly, um, to retain their workforce and to attract the kind of workforce that they needed. Because workforce development was always a concern and issue for um, how those corporations were going to be able to move forward and really uh, build the success that they had seen. On the nonprofit side, a lot of nonprofit organizations were really just taking that sort of scatter approach. They would just um, submit funding proposals to every organization that had the potential to fund them, uh, but there was no real strategy behind it. And they, they really were struggling with how could they diversify their funding streams. And so this idea of social enterprise really became um, an opportunity for the business community and the nonprofit community to come together and look at, again, really strategic approach to funding, but as important to help uh, increase capital, uh, community capital, community value, community benefit. And we saw that happening in Calgary with uh, organizations like um, Social Ventures, um, who would use their business skills to um, financially invest in nonprofit organizations to help them develop a, um, a business model that would allow them to incorporate a social enterprise into their organization. So that really was embedded in my path uh, towards social procurement. 
Uh, when I moved to Vancouver Island and began my role with the Chamber of Commerce, again, I saw a great opportunity to bring together business and nonprofits to look at how collectively they could have community impact. And again, uh, here in Campbell River, we went through some significant uh, challenges with our workforce um, where we really needed to um, diversify our workforce and create opportunities to keep our youth uh, in our community. And social enterprise was one of the ways that we saw as a pathway to do that. I developed a social enterprise award as part of our community awards uh, at the chamber. And uh, through just that outreach, um, uh, had the opportunity to see what was happening on Vancouver Island uh, with individuals like Christy that were working in social procurement, building a foundation for social procurement. Um, through that process, um, I was uh, subsequently elected to city council. I'm a second term city councillor. And uh, that work with social procurement um, really heightened awareness that we are having uh, spends in our community using public funds that really were based on um, a model that did not consider community benefit, community capital, how we could leverage those funds to really uh, do the work of city council and, uh, and meet the needs that we had as a region. Um, so our community, uh, Campbell River, uh, participated in the first pilot project to look at social procurement at a, uh, within a city, a local uh, regional level, and it was a big success. It has its challenges. Our staff, I think, were a little bit reticent until they took the training and understood really what was involved. Um, our council were sort of, um, okay, we'll wait and see what the impact is going to be, but where we could align both from a council perspective as well as the staff is this is this is money that we are all public funds that we are already spending in our community intending to spend if there's an opportunity to leverage those funds for community benefit if there's an opportunity to support workforce development or to support marginalized individuals to enter the workforce, to create a community benefit, why would we not want to take advantage of that? And I think that question um, really started Campbell River on the path of saying, absolutely, let's look at it. So it was a bit of a leap of faith, <clears throat> excuse me, when our community, uh, when our council endorsed participating in the pilot project. <clears throat> but as we move through that, what has happened subsequent to that is we actually have a social procurement policy embedded in our bylaws now. We have started with a um, RFP that includes social procurement. I'm sorry, I've got a bit of a tickle here. I'm just going to take a bit of a drink. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, our council, because they have taken and participated in the training and they see that the return on our investment of being a member of CCSPI has really benefited our staff to become change agents, to work with our community, to work with our um, suppliers, to help collectively build an opportunity to keep our youth at home, which has always been a challenge. Um, our youth leave the community. And we have a strong First Nations community as well who want to live back in our community, who may go away to university, may even go away to pursue a career, but they want to come home and um, back home. And what we have seen and what we've heard is that a lot of them see the opportunity of social procurement, social enterprises as being a pathway to remaining in the community, um, supporting the community and really seeing it as a viable way to um, stay here and raise a family. So social enterprise, social procurement truly have been a way for us to help build our local economy and help build uh, opportunity in our community which like many of your communities is going through significant change. I'd like to maybe just stop right there and uh, give a bit of background on CCSPI. <clears throat> um, again, Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative um, started as a group of six Vancouver Island communities that came together um, across Vancouver Island. There's small communities, rural communities, um, mid-sized communities, a lot of diversity. Um, and I think it was really important for those communities who were looking to stabilize their local economies to see social procurement as a potential 
opportunity um, and, and a solution, uh, one solution uh, that would help engage the community in ways to um, see themselves differently. So we began to ask how procurement dollars are being spent in our communities. Uh, we applied for funding, we presented at regional conferences, uh, we put out our RFPs and contracted uh, Christy and her group in March uh, 2019. Um, started with six members. We now have 20 members. Um, we have the BC government and federal government representation on CCSPI. I think the big benefit, uh, certainly what our council saw as a big benefit, is if we were to try and do this on our own to develop the kinds of tools, resources, templates, um, create the network uh, throughout the communities and throughout the region and throughout the island uh, to talk about social procurement and learn from each other, uh, that would have been a huge investment of time uh, and dollars. So being a member of CCSPI really allowed us as a, as a council to um, see the benefit and the return on our investment of becoming a member um, that our staff would really value the opportunity of those learnings. And it has been incredible to hear um, how staff, again, have really embraced the idea of social procurement. And what is, um, in some cases, very complicated complicated RFPs, RFIs, but they have the confidence now to be able to move forward, break it down, understand where they can go. They have a network of people that they can consult with. Um, I think that was one of the biggest challenges that we saw in our council and in our staff is where do you begin? Yes, we agree that this is a great direction to take, but where do we begin? And how do we measure our impact? And how do we measure the effectiveness of how we are engaging in social procurement? We have all of those tools with CCSPI. Um, it truly has given us the foundation and the basis to be able to commit to, uh, in our own community, just recently with our financial deliberations, to using social procurement now as a project um, that will have operating funds behind it. And that took, um, that took three years to get to that point. Um, but again, um, it's not, it wasn't smooth sailing. It was constantly reevaluating, ensuring that uh, council members felt confident and informed on what social procurement was. Um, but the tools are there and the resources were there. Um, I think that the, um, Moving forward, the impact of what this is going to mean to our community as part of our COVID recovery strategy. Um, it, we're discussing that in January, uh, but clearly social procurement uh, is a tool, is a resource uh, for COVID recovery. And uh, I'm looking forward to the strategic planning session that we're going to be having as a council in January, uh, again, to really leverage uh, the investment we've made in social procurement um, and how this again can drive our community forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Colleen. Um, and Christy, Christy Fairhome Mader, you're up. Hi, thanks so much. And, and thank you, Colleen, um, for summarizing a lot about CCSBI. I really appreciate that. You know, in our region, uh, local governments spend $110 million plus annually on what we call under 25K spend. Um, and they spend over $1.6 billion annually um, on over 25K spend. And this doesn't usually count the big infrastructure projects that come into the region. That's a significant amount of value that can be created in local economies um, that can derive and, and drive community benefit. And um, CCSBI has been working really hard to begin to um, put the intention behind the spend and to target it back into community benefit. Um, no matter whether a vendor is coming from a local vendor or whether that vendor is coming from off island to deliver a, to deliver a project, but to, to begin to ask and require community benefits to be integrated into that spend. To date, we've had about 30 pilots that have taken place in the last 18 months. Um, the way that the process works in CCSBI is we do uh, training and capacity building, um, speak to councils, speak to staff, um, and then look at for ways to, input, to test and try pilots to to work around what that policy could look like, what could be the benefits and the criteria that are put into RFPs, RFIs, RFQs um, to, to focus specifically on, on using procurement to address community issues and community challenges. So um, since then, that's been about $150 million of pilot spend. 
Um, and as the communities come out of those pilots, um, we're doing an assessment and looking and beginning to answer some of the questions that seem to arise every time um, we speak to council members. So I wanted to just take a moment and talk a little bit about the myths that in speaking to councils across the island, I see, I hear the same questions come up, right? And those same questions arise around social procurement that, that by now I'm, I have a pretty stock answer. So I thought I would just address a couple of them. Um, the first one is that, you know, isn't this going to cost taxpayers more? You know, right, so we have one taxpayer, and this is a, this is another thing that's going to cost taxpayers more. And what I would say is that um, to date, we have not seen that the cost of the RFPs or the RFQs um, have a higher price point. Instead, what we see is that the social and environmental criteria that are added into it become the tipping point. And so the price and quality are coming in at the same place, but it's beginning to have this added value is beginning to tip where procurement staff are making those decisions. So those extra points that are awarded around that do have real value. Now, the place that it does have cost more is around change, right? Is that we're asking procurement staff to gain capacity to think in a different way. We're asking councils and, and the organization, the government organization to think and act in a, in a value perspective versus a lowest cost perspective. And that does create change. And so there is time around building that capacity, having the conversations, identifying the champions, communicating to your vendors. Like there's that piece, but the actual cost of um, of doing the business has not been seen as being a discernible difference. Now, I also want to say is that sometimes paying more does make sense. And so I don't want to always say like, you can get all of this at the same <laughs> prices, is that we're also seeing a shift in what we're beginning to ask from businesses, just globally, from vendors, from what we, what we want for our communities. And I think there does come a question to ask, like, does that kind of value that we want to provide to our community, is it worth it? And so I think that even though we haven't seen those those price increases, I think that there's space to begin to ask about when it creates significant community value, it might be worth paying more. So um, the other one that we hear is, is it going to make the private sector upset? Um, and I would say that the business world is changing and businesses are often already thinking about their environmental, their social impact. They're being asked these questions by com customers, by consumers already and that this in putting it into procurement you begin to reward the businesses that are there they begin to reward the businesses that are the early adopters that are good citizens are thinking this way are doing that and you begin to create incentives for those other businesses to come along um, and i think that in in the time that we're in right now asking those things from our businesses from everybody in our community um, for those benefits are, is really critical um, i think that we sometimes hear um, i'm going to say like a, a, an idea that governments shouldn't tell private sector what to do. Um, and here I, we have a conversation around as a procurement is that the governments are the customer and customers get to say and ask for the things that they want from the people that they buy from. And so by looking and being a customer, valuing your taxpayers and your citizens and valuing the community in that way and signaling to the, to the market that this is what's important and this is required, then is, is acting as a customer. Um, there is a part that we see vendor capacity is is important and especially in our community where we, our communities which are small and rural and remote and tend to be small is that often the vendors don't have the capacity. So you have all the vendors that have already done business with procurement and they understand how to do that. And so it's just about helping them integrate social procurement and understand that how to how to share and speak about and talk about and look at their hiring, their apprenticeship, their community benefit practices, all of that. But what social procurement does, which is quite amazing, is that it opens the market up to new vendors. Um, it, when you unbundle projects, when you ask for these values, other vendors that haven't seen themselves in the procurement process begin to think, maybe that's something that I could do and I could bid on. And that's where there's some capacity building to help those vendors who have not yet bid on contracts like that to build the capacity so that they can. And those tend to be smaller, more local businesses. They tend to be social enterprises. They tend to be the businesses that deliver bottom and triple bottom line value back to community that this is a this is a new thing. So by creating a standardized process, by making it transparent and open so that all vendors understand what's happening, by unbundling projects, by allowing smaller vendors to apply, and by providing capacity, that's what we call like taking that ecosystem approach to helping, um, you know, helping everybody be able to deliver that benefit back to community. So um, I won't speak much more. We have and uh, part of our project is to have 
build capacity with individual communities and organizations. And then we have a region wide initiatives as well, which is we measure impact across the whole region. And we're starting that that now and building out that framework. And we also are building out a vendor database um, and um, education and capacity building process so that vendors who um, no matter what community they're in, they can say if they can they can land onto the the regional database and then when we get to the small spends and you get to the direct awards and when you get to rfps is there's already a list of social value vendors that that procurement staff can can um access somebody did say can we join from off island onto ccsbi i'm currently right now uh, the coastal community social procurement initiatives for vancouver island and the coast um and taking that regional approach but we're super happy to share the lessons learned and, and what we're doing over here thank you Thanks, Christy. And to be honest, I was going to ask the same. We're an island. <laughs> um, thanks so much. Um, and our last panelist of the day uh, is myself, actually, and Sheldon Pollitt. Um, I'll let Sheldon start it off, and then I'll chime in and interrupt as per usual. Sounds good, Chelsea. Um, so usually you start this story from a social enterprise perspective. How does you know, an agency that's for 30 years defined itself as a support agency for, uh, for uh, homeless and, and vulnerable youth. How do we end up in, in this conversation? So uh, in 2006, we launched uh, what we thought at the time was an ambitious plan to create 14 units of affordable housing for young people, while at the same time dealing with the reality that we had an awful lot of young people who uh, hadn't finished high school, were not engaged in the labor market, and were really struggling to figure out not just in terms of how to define an educational and an employment future, uh, but a future that they felt was safe and, and sustainable. So for us, obviously, creating those 14 years of affordable housing, we learned a lot from an enterprise perspective, even though back in the day, we were not talking about social enterprise, we were not talking about social procurement, we were talking about how do we maximize the value of the 14 units of affordable housing that we were going to build. So that was the impetus. I'll, I'll fast forward a, a number of years around, it really is a story from a procurement side of it. The, from the social enterprise part of it, our model is this, you know, we do a lot of asbestos abatement work, for example, has nothing to do with our mandate. What does have to do with our mandate is that is really a, a vehicle to manufacture uh, employment hours and training uh, opportunities for young people uh, that we can wrap intensive models of support around when it comes to their mental health, their housing, their addictions, all of the barriers and challenges that are really causing the breakdown for, for those young people. So that's the enterprise motive. The procurement motive really became the story of putting our money where our own mouth is and buying from ourselves. So we've gone on to create now 25 units of housing, all built by our social enterprises, purchased from ourselves. Our social enterprises do the maintenance. So we were spending an awful lot of money annually, for example, on maintenance to the private sector. Nothing wrong with the private sector. We partner with them all the time, but figured out through this model that buying from ourselves is, is how we maximize the value of the money we're going to spend anyway. Um, it snows a lot in Newfoundland, for those who, who don't know. Uh, we were spending $50,000 a year, again, on a private contractor. We've now purchased that from ourselves, from our social enterprise, added a number of contracts for other nonprofits, and now we generate much more employment and, and impact for young people. Uh, I think that those contracts are somewhere in the $150,000 range now. Uh, we had one of our snowstorms of the century last winter. And that snowstorm, I'll tell you, created more hours of employment than I ever imagined possible. So uh, it's being able to translate that value in a, in a real way for the young people we serve. Uh, we've got a number of partners, uh, Stellar Circle. We've, we've maximized even more value because now we buy from each other. We purchase cleaning services from Stellar Circle. They purchase snow clearing services from us. Uh, Caroline Harding is also on the call, Smart Ice again a nonprofit doing amazing work in the north. We partner and purchase things from ourselves in terms of whether it's knowledge or, or equipment. So those are the stories that I can share with you that led Choices for Youth to be in this space. And I'm going to turn it over to Chelsea in, in just one second. We also have done substantial amount of work for our provincial housing authority, manufacturing, you know, probably well in excess of 50,000 hours of employment over the last number of years on money they were gonna spend anyway uh, and maximizing that value. One of the critical pieces why this 
procurement conversation is so important right now. Everything I just told you happened in, in an environment with no targets around social procurement, with no real clear understanding of how the, the value created in one department is accrued to another department. Uh, I keep telling government, as far as I know, there's only one treasury board, but yet we haven't, we don't have the mechanisms to understand across government departments. When you create that social procurement value, it may very well show up in another part of government, but it's still tremendous value. So what is possible if we, you know, hit, hit the fast forward button and arrive in a space where there's a much more assertive, let's use that word, assertive social procurement approach in our province and what becomes possible. And on that note, I'll turn it over to Chelsea. Thanks, Sheldon. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight in my piece here is the recognition that Newfoundland is in um, challenging economic times. We have, and there's many things that are driving that, uh, you know, it's certainly a declining population, um, uh, geographic kind of spread. We have economic challenges with uh, a heavily resource-based economy. We have you know, an incredibly um, expensive healthcare system, then those costs keep rising. Um, and, you know, when we look at Newfoundland and Labrador, I think sometimes with folks in the in my sector, but certainly I'm sure my colleagues in across the province and in government would agree that sometimes these wicked problems or these huge problems feel insurmountable. And so, when we look at social procurement, we potentially have an opportunity to do things just a little bit differently. As my colleagues from across, across Canada and in Scotland have identified, they've identified what's possible and what's possible with strong policy, what's possible with collaboration and thinking collectively. Um, Jerry expressed uh, consort the value of working together as a community sector through consortiums. Christy identified lots of opportunities where community intermediaries and certainly um, policymakers like Colleen, how they've been able to connect the dots and make things happen. And one of the things that we have to be okay with is that given the complexity of the problems we're facing, it's gonna require complex solutions and probably extraordinary opportunities to work together. Social procurement is one of those, but I think one of the things that has been demonstrated with what David has said and some of the work by Social Canada has done is that it doesn't actually have to be that hard. So when you look at the value for money, as David described, or that communities should retain the value um, of their tax dollars. It seems pretty logical. It seems pretty logical to me. I think Christy hit it on the head to say, you know, why shouldn't government determine who, who they spend their money with and what they want their money to do? And so when I apply this to social procurement and social enterprise is that we can generate a hell of a lot of value by employing someone who is perhaps vulnerable, but moreover, supporting them through the complex challenges that they come up against every day that prevents them from connecting with the labor market. So if I could break it down in the choices context, choices for use context, you know, we run a portfolio of social enterprises and they're companies and businesses just like any other. They have employees, they have customers, they have targets that they have to hit, they're part of staff teams, they work in community, et cetera, et cetera. But the big difference is that through that employment, we can provide educational opportunities that perhaps wasn't there, weren't there for them, but more importantly, the supports actually required to make it make a difference. And so when we talk about economic development in this province, we often miss the human part of it. We often miss one valuable word in economic development and that is community. And so if we can prioritize what the community economic development look like, looks like,
requires supporting our communities to get there, then we actually have a shot at making a stronger, more diversified economy with healthier communities. And that goes um, to what David was saying earlier about, you know, the human capital and social capital investing, that stuff all matters. And it's a long game we're playing. So when we look at austerity and cuts and these kind of things, we also have to think through, well, what actually will give us the more bang for our buck? What is the value for money? And when I look at social procurement, which is the money that government is spending anyway, if you procure, um, you know, either goods and services, pro even programs from community providers that can demonstrate additional value within community or potentially the vulnerable sector in which they support, and they can demonstrate outcomes. To me, that makes a hell of a lot more sense and is not a question of whether austerity or cost effective or any of those things. It also means that we're just investing our money better. And to me, that's the difference. That is the stark difference between, as David said earlier, the sharpening, you know, who gets the, you know, the sharpest pencil. <laughs> I really like that. Um, that it really does mean, you know, how can we get the best contribution? And we all make decisions like that. So none of us here, you know, buy goods and services um, just by thinking about um, ourselves alone. And so I would certainly encourage any government uh, policymakers or any folks, even in your daily lives, to think about what it would mean to make your dollars go further. And we do that every day within our social enterprises with our construction company, Impact Construction, Neighborhood, our retail clothing store, secondhand clothing store, and the shop, which does uh, small scale manufacturing and production. We're able to do a heck of a lot by operating within this space. And so um, I'll, I'll end it there. And as the moderator, I felt like I had a little extra time. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think it's important to note that just because the economic context looks the way it does, it doesn't preclude us from doing innovative things. So with that, I think we're gonna move to the question and answer period. Um, David, both David and Tori have said, you know, Populate your populate the question the chat box with your questions. If we don't get to them today uh, within the panel, we also will be able to kind of address them off or online in a different format. So fear not. Um, and I'm going to moderate the questions. And so for the panelists on the call, I'm probably going to pick on you um, for specific questions. And uh, I'm going to keep an eye on my chat box. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to start off with Christy and, and Christy, this question um, is, you know, why is social procurement important now? And, you know, building on what I just said around uh, tough economic times, how do we prioritize social procurement when things aren't going so well, economically speaking? Thanks, Chelsea. Um, I think that um, if not now, <laughs> when, in terms of when things are tough. I mean, um, if we're not intentional and able to direct our resources back into our communities um, now, then I think I just I just encourage everybody to do now because when we when we lose our businesses and when we lose um, people from our communities, those kind of impacts are felt significantly that have a real knock on impact, right? I mean, local governments, they're dependent on property taxes, they're dependent on, on vibrancy within your local economy within your community. Um, so by, by being able to direct your spend into those community benefits into local enterprises into social enterprises, in that kind of way, not only, you know, provides that that value and open stores to businesses and to people who might not have had access to those economic opportunities, but it also does help stabilize communities and provide a, a cyclical economic loop. As David talked about that economic multiplier effect is not just people spending and keeping their profits and their dollars in their community. It's also stabilizing your local economy that then provides that tax base that goes back to our into our local governments, into our provincial governments and so on. So I think at this time when we're when we're facing a real challenge. Um, there's a few things that can be really done to help 
help bring social procurement as a, as a solution to COVID and as a solution to the economic challenges that are being faced. And this is, we, we did do a bit of a, of a flyer around what those would be, but very quickly, like unbundle those projects, communicate with your vendors, look at your thresholds. You know, can you raise your thresholds to match the, the trade agreements? ask big contractors to use social value suppliers and local suppliers, you know, and, um, and make it standardized and transparent across all of your areas. Awesome. Thanks, Christy. Colleen, I'm going to pick on you. Um, how, as a counselor, you know, how do, how might we make that case that in tough economic times that this is a, is a, is not only, you know, if not when, um, how do we in, in, inspire the policymakers to, to move forward. Thank you. Well, I think it's, um, Christy highlighted it a little bit. I think we need to make sure that um, we provide opportunities for council to understand um, the benefits and values of social procurement. And uh, I know we're happy to share um, tools that have been developed. Uh, I'm sure there's a uh, um, some information that uh, Christy would be able to circulate that sort of gives that overview. And David from BiSocial um, also has some really good um, general documents, but it's to be informed. Um, we can't make policy decisions without the information. Um, so when I share with you that, you know, the decision for uh, our council to move forward um, was based on some reticence on council where they were concerned about, you know, is this legal? Uh, that, that was one of the questions when social procurement came forward. Um, so it's a process. It's informing and engaging your council members um, uh, in a way that allows them to see social procurement as um, money that is already gonna be spent in our community. But what I would say um, is different at this point in time is that um, we're looking at infrastructure opportunities to um, move forward in our communities in the 18 months ahead. We're moving into a process of developing our 10 year financial plans, our financial plans. And having a discussion of social procurement at this time is absolutely the right time to be talking about it. Even if there isn't full buy-in on council, it puts social procurement on the table. And I think Oftentimes, that's the biggest step is just have that conversation around social procurement. As I say, the tools, resources are there to ensure that council is making an informed decision um, on uh, seeing this as a, a economic recovery for their communities. Um, but I would just say reach out and uh, and attain those uh, um, obtain those uh, resources. But I think all of us are willing to talk to councils as well. So if that's, uh, if that's something that would help, um, I'm sure there's an opportunity to speak directly to councils. Awesome, thank you, Colleen. Um, I'll add to a question that came in from Craig Pollitt with Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador. And this one's directed back at you, Colleen. Were there provincial and legislative barriers to overcome establishing a municipal social procurement framework? Um, no, uh, council was able to establish their own, um, obviously within the municipal act, but uh, able to st establish their own policies. I think if anything in British Columbia, there were benefits because social procurement was something that was talked at the legislative level um, in our province. And so um, there already was um, sort of a grassroots um, acknowledgement of social procurement and social benefit. Um, so there really were no barriers as such. I would say the biggest barrier was at the council table uh, where there were just various um, levels of understanding at the time that social procurement was introduced on what it was. And so as council became informed, uh, really that became the catalyst and impetus for us to move forward. But again, I would say that our, uh, from a provincial and federal standpoint, um, great support. And we could point to decision-making policies that have been um, established at the federal level that really supported us in looking at um, how we would put out our RFPs. And, uh, and so, yes, I'd say if anything, uh, they were, were great supporters of what we, what we were trying to do at a local level. 
Thanks. And I do, I do apologize. I, I just uh, sent a little note. Um, I do have a council, uh, an important council meeting that I have to attend. So I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to speak with you. Good luck with the rest of the uh, panel and discussion today. And I'm certainly available to answer any questions after this. Thank you. Thanks so much, Colleen. Thank you for joining us. I think I'll bounce, I'll bounce the next question over to David. And it's kind of a, a you know, is it fair to say that... <clears throat> the conditions for success would be that provincial and municipal um, uh, conversations should be happening kind of um, at the same time or at least uh, collaboratively to really get social procurement off the ground here in Newfoundland and Labrador. I think there's both levels, uh, Chelsea, because what we've seen uh, several years ago were provincial leadership around some social enterprise strategies and so social procurement evolved. Then there was a, a number of elections <clears throat> and the leadership in provinces changed. <clears throat> and then that shifted the emphasis. And it really has recently been municipalities um, which are leading. So when we look across Canada right now, we see uh, like CCSPI, that's 22 rural and remote municipalities and regions working together. We see uh, Calgary uh, not just doing a policy, but Calgary setting up a, a multi-sector advisory group representing construction, community, small business, government, all at the same table to do a three-year change management process. Because I think Jerry referred to this, Christy did, and Colleen did, is that everyone's talking about, this is not just uh, writing a new law. This is about managing the change of, from procurement being this lowest dollar only to community development, as you talked about. That's a change in tactics. It's a change in strategy. It's a change in behavior. So in Victoria, training, you know, like 300 people who hold credit cards on how to look at local value when they make a purchase. Do they just go to the computer and go to Amazon or do they make the effort to buy locally? Those are cultural change. In Calgary, Edmonton, we see it across Canada. It's not just the, the rules. It's really that managing that multi-sector engagement regardless of the level of government because the federal government has with infrastructure, the community employment benefits that are required, but they only happen at a local level. So it, it has to be this multi-level and multi-stakeholder engagement. And I think we have to think about it as, as, you know, as you said, this is a long game. This is not just new legislation. This is about changing how we view, how we spend taxpayer money. Great. Thanks so much, David. I, um, there was a, a question that came in from Leslie Dunn from MetroWorks. Um, and, you know, she expressed some perhaps uh, frustration with the conversation, conversationing, <laughs> but perhaps the, the traction, lacking traction and action in certain provinces. I'm going to bounce this question to Jerry. Um, Jerry, in Scotland, in your experience, did you find that, are, are there any best practices that can help inform or ignite the spark um, in, in your experiences that really moves it towards from conversations to action? Um, I think we needed to work at a number of levels. Um, we secured the support of ministers, um, cabinet secretaries within the Scottish government fairly early. Um, but we recognize there's a significant gap between securing the support of elected officials who will not be doing any of the work um, and the procurement officers that have to let the contracts for social care, recycling, um, uh, uh, food services and, and all of these. So we really needed to work at, at a number of levels. And I think one of the most effective um, actions that we took uh, over a period of five years was to convene, um, to establish and to convene um, a community of practice amongst the economic development officers at, at our, on the 32 local authorities in Scotland. So um, these are the people who let the, who put out the RFPs 
um, and by creating a community of practice where they came together every few months um, to deal with very tangible issues like um, uh, um, is, is this action that we want to take, is it legal or, or might it not be legal? Um, or how have others dealt with uh, the following service contract for, for, uh, for IT services or, or, or similar? So by having a community of practice uh, that, that, that we were able to convene, provide with expert support and expertise, um, they became a great peer group to each other. There was, um, it ended up at about 46 people um, uh, attending those meetings. And um, that was uh, a very effective step in ensuring that um, uh, that blockages didn't become major hurdles and major blockages, that, that they became issues where the collective um, addressed them and, and then could move on. So I would say that it's ensuring that you win hearts and minds um, at, at the commissioner and, and politician level uh, and that you actually put in a whole load of practical support um, uh, at the level where people are actually going to be doing the work. Great. Thanks so much, Jerry. Um, I've got a question that came in from Josh Smee uh, with Food First NL, and he's curious whether folks have any thoughts or successes to share around longer contracts or forward contracting arrangements. I think the problem that Josh identifies within his question is that there's lots of opportunities, particularly around institutional buying, specifically around food, um, but if producers are going to be required to scale up and make longer term and larger investments in production, will it be worth it in the long term? Has anybody on the panel, I'll leave it wide open, has anybody worked with any folks who've experienced those challenges? So one of the food projects that's probably one of the greatest social enterprise examples of food social enterprise and in institutions is the University of Winnipeg where they opened up their procurement and really set it up for a social enterprise to win that thing. And the emphasis is on how much food can we buy from local growers? So the chef emphasizes that and created employment for people who are facing barriers to employment and changed the food behavior of the university students to actually have healthy food on campus. So when you think about a procurement by an institution around food, this had all kinds of ampl you know, amplifications that local farmers were given an advantage because they could buy directly from them if they could provide the contracted food. The, the employment shifted from just uh, temporary you know, low wages to training and long-term employment for people facing barriers. And you know, if you're gonna buy food on campus now, yes, there was a transition from crappy food to healthy food, but they got through it. And now it's really uh, an engaged process uh, with the community, with the institution and, and with the food buyers. They still have an institutional food purchaser, but their percentage of food delivery is much lower than it was seven years ago. Um, I also wanna jump in on this question because it's around um, things that have to kind of operate in tandem. Um, one thing we're really missing kind of at all levels in Newfoundland and Labrador is a real strong um, support system for economic development and how economic development actions and support then need to connect in with communities. So even when you look at our, uh, you know, our cities or even provincially, um, there's really not necessarily those community economic developers that Jerry spoke of that are there within community to like steward um, these community development uh, pieces along. We have some small infrastructure, certainly across the province and hub communities, but if we're gonna actually take, if we actually wanna develop this sector and develop the supply end of things, we have to think about how that connects in really, particularly in the rural context with our economic development strategy and actually not, and it should can be inside the economic development strategy with the appropriate infrastructure to assist support and, and, uh, 
and create those economic opportunities. If we're not thinking about these things as they fit together, and we're thinking about you know the social piece being completely separate from the economic piece, then we're actually going to they're going to conflict with one another. And so we've got to make sure that we help these producers. Uh, and we assist the producers to scale and, and develop on an island, it's a challenge. But we need to ensure that we have the right infrastructure across the province and lead um, a diversified economic strategy to be able to develop on the supply and, and the entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial communities to be able to, to meet the demand. Um, it's very weird to moderate yourself. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> maybe I'll just chime in here um, and kind of wrap us up. Um, I want to thank everybody so much for for your time and for joining us today. Um, I'll be sharing the chat and the questions, and then there's a request for some resources. So if the speakers have um, specific resources you'd like me to share, um, I will then email those out along with the recording. So thank you all, everyone, so much for joining us today. Um, David, Jerry, Christy, Colleen, Sheldon, and Chelsea, thank you so much. And I really hope that we can continue these conversations as we see social procurement in action in rural communities across Canada and in Newfoundland and Labrador. Thanks, everyone.